Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Amen. Yeah, y'all give them a hand. Wasn't that good? I feel like a football player this morning when they're up getting ready and warming up where they're jumping around. And I'm, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit stoked this morning. Uh, y'all glad to be here? Yeah. Uh, y'all know what this week is, don't you? Yeah. Turkey. Anybody going to eat some turkey this week? Amen. Yeah. See, here's what I know about that. I, and, and not to turn real quick, but, um, you know, this week holds for many of us great, great memories and expectations. I mean, some of you cannot wait until Thursday. I mean, you're absolutely already salivating over that dressing or mac and cheese or broccoli casserole or um, that pie. Yeah, that pecan, pecan, who, who says pecan? Pecan five, pie, amen. And, and I know some of you just cannot wait, but I also know that some of you in this room, the holidays are not fun. In fact, I was thinking this morning as I was driving in, kind of to build on what Jake was talking about a while ago, I am so grateful that so many years ago, we had one of our staff members come to us and uh, she asked about grief share and she asked about our grief that goes on in our church. So many people lose people and uh, that how do we minister to them? And so Sherry Sims, who was one of our staff members for many years, has since retired, started this thing that now Jenny Holdeman uh, continues to do. And we send out literally hundreds of books every year on grief because we know that there are people that uh, are trying to deal with grief and trying to get through. And so uh, I want to say to you, if you're in this room this morning and this is your first year alone with loss, uh, that we love you. And we're so glad you're here, and uh, we want to minister to you. And if you don't get those books, would you please, please, please allow us an opportunity to send those to you? It doesn't cost anything. Uh, we'd love to do that. Uh, Jenny writes letters uh, as well, and I would encourage you, if you know someone, in fact, I'm going to write some letters today before I go out of town. Uh, I'm going to write some letters today to some folks that I've been thinking about all week this week, praying for, that I'm going to drop in the mail before I leave because I, I want them to know that, hey, they matter because because, you know, times are uncertain. And if I've ever learned anything, the older I get, the more I realize that we do live in a world of uncertainty. I said last week, there's a one in one chance that we're all going to die if the Lord tarries. Now, if God comes back, amen, we all going to jump, all right? And we're all going to get out of here. But the reality is, unless he does not come back, uh, Jim, does, am I covering all this well? Uh, okay. Unless the Lord comes back, um, we're all going to die. And, and we don't know when. In fact, you, we, we have what's called bus books here at, uh, at Summit Heights. And y'all know what a bus book is in business? A bus book is what you keep with all your passwords and all your secret information about your office. So in case you get hit by a bus, your, your coworkers can then pick up where you left off, right? And so we have those here because there's so many different passwords and technology and that kind of stuff because we don't know. Uh, there's un uncertain social conditions if you look around, economic times, political developments. I mean, how many of you guys are watching the political developments right now and just the uncertainty and the insanity of what's going on in our country right now or the global patterns or the, uh, the weather patterns and uncertainty is nothing new. Do you know that? 
There's nothing new about all this. In fact, the characters of Scripture experience this incredible, wildly levels of uncertainty in their journeys and their walking with God and, and often feeling almost as if life was moving backwards, that life wasn't moving forward, and they were, they were struggling with this. And, and the question remains not only in their journey, but also in our journey today. And you may be right here where I'm about to say is that you may be where some of the Bible characters were that today you're asking, where is God. I mean, where is he? Did he go hide somewhere? Has he given up? Is he going to show up? And you see, some of us with confidence go, yes. But yet I also know there's some of us in this room that there's something in the back of our mind that go, where is he? And why isn't he involved? And some have run and theologians, and I use that term loosely, have run to say and prove that God has given up. He left us to our own demise that he doesn't know what's gonna happen. And so he's just kind of up there, kind of as a spectator in the sky going, well, that's a good decision, I'll help them. Or, oh my gosh, did you see that? You know, and so there's this whole idea that we're trying to explain the unexplainable and this whole relationship between God's foreknowledge and his presence, trying to put that together with men's free will and limited view. And so for years, men have been trying to simply explain away in their finite minds of what is really the unexplainable and those extreme forms that kind of fall at the very least. Some say we're just a bunch of pre-programmed robots. We don't have a choice all the way to the other end of, of people saying, well, God gave up and he doesn't know what's gonna happen. Problem is when we try to codify or systematize the unexplainable, it falls short or at the very least rejects God's omniscience and omnipresence and his sovereignty. You see, we believe, and I would challenge you on this, we believe that to understand God, it comes through faith. Without faith, the scripture says it's impossible to please God. There is a faith aspect of this. And people get all freaked out when we talk about a faith aspect. And yet, every one of you sat in a chair this morning by faith, trusting that it would hold you. And you never thought about it. You got in your car this morning, most of us, because some of you drive hoopties and others of you drive new cars, right? And most of you got in the car this morning and turned the key and never thought about it not starting. See, I have a car every once in a while when I crank it, it, it where I'm not sure it's going to start, Amen. You see, he's ever present. He never leaves us, he never forsakes us. And those are his words. And so by faith and my limited knowledge, I trust him. So today I wanna to look at a name that talks about the presence of God. Where is God? And is God even present? Is God even in control? Is God even around? And we find it in Ezekiel chapter 48. And we're, we're not gonna go there this morning because if you know anything about the end of Ezekiel, it's, it's complicated, okay? I'm just gonna say that from a preacher's standpoint because if it's complicated from a preacher's standpoint, then I'm not about to wade in to a whole lot of what's going on at the end of Ezekiel because it's the end times. And it's when God is reestablishing the city of Israel and, and, and the final city and he's given all these parameters, he's given all these things and, and we could wade into the second coming and we could wade into all of the different, aspects of Jesus coming back and what the second coming and the millennial and post and pre and mid and pan and all that. And we could figure all that out. But here's what we know about it. At the end of Ezekiel chapter 48, it says that in that city, that God is there. He's ever present. He's ever present. That he's there. So here's the big question that I, I began to think about this last week. Do we have to wait until we get to the new city to experience God all the time? Do we have to wait until we die to experience God? Because that's what some tell us. Maybe that's where you are this morning. And that's okay. I'm so glad you're here if you believe that. Because I don't want you to run out of here. Because Summit Heights has always been a safe place for you to investigate the claims of Christ. To keep coming back and being loved on. Is there a way to have God's presence, to experience his presence? Does he, does he even promise his presence today? And so I was reading in Matthew chapter 26 this last week. In fact, if you have your Bibles or your apps, you can turn over there. We're going to look at a few verses, and then we're going to read the very last verse, a few verses of Matthew, the book. 
And Jesus is coming to the home stretch of his ministry. He's, he's been doing ministry for three years and he's having his last supper. In fact, every year when it came to the Passover meal, he and his disciples would gather together and they would, they would have the last supper. But this year's different. This year was totally different when Jesus was gathering with his disciples and because he's about to be betrayed and arrested and tried and convicted and beaten and hung on a cross. And so Jesus and his men were gathered there together for the Passover meal, the annual meal that they all celebrate and commemorate the night uh, that before the morning when the nation would be released. Remember, the Passover was when Israel was in Egypt and God said, look, I'm gonna come through and if you put blood over the post, I will pass over your home, but all those that don't have the blood, that, that there will be death on that home. And so they, they're commemorating that every year, celebrating what God has done. 400 years that the children of Israel were in slavery. 400 years, it seemed like God was faithless in this moment. Where was God in all of that? Well, they were in slavery 400 years. That the Jewish people lived as slaves, but it eventually became a nation. 400 years of unanswered prayer, so to speak. 400 years of harsh treatment. And then God sends a deliverer, Moses, and he delivers them out. And Moses became one of the most powerful men on the planet. And he delivered the children of Israel. Now, 1,400 years later, Jesus is gathered with his disciples to commemorate this historic event. It's, it's incredible. But the disciples were a little bit distracted. See, sometimes we read that and we see that, that beautiful painting that's, that we see and they're all reclined and they're all just, they're oogling at each other and they're looking at that. And we have this peaceful moment. But I, I, I have to believe that things weren't really going that well when you look at the gospels and you look at what Jesus was doing to, because their popularity had kind of diminished. In fact, they began to notice that when Jesus would enter Jerusalem, he never entered during the day. He always entered at evening at night when no one could see because his popularity had gotten even to the point that there was a whole lot of secrecy about what was going on. In fact, there was a whole lot of secrecy that night that they didn't even know where they were gonna meet. Jesus sent them into town and said, go to this man, he'll have a room, ask for it and go prepare. They didn't even know where they were going because the, all that was going around, around Jesus was unrest. In, in fact, the disciples knew there was a movement to have Jesus arrested. They had heard about it and, and, and Jesus kept even talking about his death. I mean, how fun is that to be around people that always talk, I'm gonna die. You're gonna miss me when I'm gone. We say that to our kids all the time, amen? <laughs> You're gonna miss me when I'm gone. You have to do your own laundry, amen? <laughs> and then Judas, then you had Judas. Y'all remember that dude? You know he had to be acting strange. They gather for the meal. He's already sold Jesus out. You see, these guys have grown accustomed. These guys have grown accustomed to being the man. They had grown accustomed to their popularity. And, and what they thought was the last word in Ezekiel, and all of a sudden, 1,400 years later, Jesus comes onto the scene and, and God begins to move and, and now things are completely unrest. And Jesus comes on the scene, that long-awaited Messiah, and things begin to change. And the disciples saw the miracles and the healings, and they saw all these things that would happen, and these crowds. I mean, can you imagine these guys hanging out with Jesus? Can you imagine how we would be? You ever hung out with celebrities? Anybody? Okay, I know we live in Hawkins. I get it, okay? But you've dreamed about it. That's why you watch those shows on TV, right? That's why when those documentaries come on, and you're watching it going, dude, that'd be so cool. These guys were living it. These guys were in the midst drawing these crowds. And yet here they are three years later, all of that is beginning to diminish. I read this last week that somebody said, you wanna be successful, but not too successful, right? Because if you're too successful, people begin to envy you and want what you have. And see, Jesus had gotten the attention of all the Pharisees and all the local leaders. He had the attention of the Rome and the Romans and the Israelite clergy sure didn't like and the Romans didn't like because it seemed like he was stirring up trouble everywhere he went. And so here's the scene as they gathered for their annual feast and that painting is so beautiful, but the unrest that was happening. And then things get even crazier. Look at Matthew 26, 20. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, I'll tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. How's that for the meal starter? Go ahead and start Thanksgiving out that way this week, amen? 
I know who you are. I mean, just sit down at the table and start pointing fingers at your family. See how well that goes, right? That's what you, that's what you, sometimes we miss what the scripture says, don't we? But Jesus just starts, I know who's, I know who's gonna do it. And since he was rarely wrong, this didn't come as good news. I mean, there was nobody going, Jesus, come on, Jesus, really? what are you about? Who? Because they knew, because in their mind they were going, is it me? Is it me? They were just really hoping it wasn't them. And, and they're really hoping it really wasn't gonna happen. I mean, it was as if Jesus had given up. He was walking into a trap and you have this group of men that are grieving because they're realizing all this talk of death and all this talk that I know who's gonna betray me. And all of a sudden these guys realize that, oh my gosh, we're gonna lose him. We're gonna lose our leader. We're gonna lose our rabbi, our teacher. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna lose the healer. We're gonna lose our meal ticket. I mean, for three years, they had followed this guy and he had fed them and taken care of them and told them what to do. And now he's talking about, I'm gonna leave it. And, and one of you are gonna do it. Just can't imagine what was going on. I mean, come on, let's be honest. It's those pain points that bring us into perspective, isn't it? It's those points of pain that we have in our journey that bring perspective towards God and your relationship to him. And for some of you, years ago, you turned against God. And for some of you, and those pain points, it turns you to him. And you see, no matter where you find yourself today, here's what I know, some of the brightest moments in our lives are a result of some of the darkest brokenness that we've ever walked through. And so you don't have to be a believer in Jesus to know that's true. For some of us, some of those darkest moments had led us to the greatest moments of enlightenment. When we can see that God's working through undesirable circumstances, even the ones that we bring on ourselves, amen? There's that sense of purpose and presence that over time emerges. And the story continues in Matthew. And I want to give you the short story because we could, we could spend a whole lot of time in this. But as they observe the Last Supper, as they've done for years in the past, I love this verse. Look at Matthew 26, 30. I was thinking about this a while ago as Brian and the team were leading. It says, then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, I, I, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I've just thought about this all week this week. And this is for every man in the room. Jesus sang. I'm just gonna let that sit for a minute. Jesus sang. And I, sometimes I watch us as we worship as, as your pastor and the women are singing and the men are too cool. Okay, Jesus sang a hymn. I know it hurts, doesn't it? Jesus sang. Let's keep going. Jesus predicts they will all fall away. He's given them this incredible picture he says, guys, not only are one of you gonna betray me, but you're gonna fall away, you're gonna doubt, you're gonna give up, you're gonna run away. You're gonna forget almost everything you've ever been taught. Then Peter jumps in and goes, no, 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 not me. I'll never do it. And Jesus goes, no, you'll be the one that not only does it once, you'll do it three times before the rooster crows. So they then return and retire to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray shortly after that moment of worship. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane of them singing that hymn. Jesus is betrayed, he's arrested. He's taken off to be tried. Peter sure enough betrayed Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. That little teenage girl around that fire. Judas goes out and hangs himself in complete total despair. Jesus is tried before Pilate, mocked and crucified after his death. And this guy named Joseph of Arimathea, I mean, where did he come from? Comes and grabs Jesus' body and takes him to a borrowed tomb. I don't need it long, just a few days, amen? I mean, how many of you go to the cemetery today? Go, I just need one for three days. I mean, that's Joseph of Arimathea. We don't need it long. We're just gonna put him in here. He's coming back, amen? I just, I love that. <laughs> And three days later, he raises from the grave, appears to his disciples, 500 other people, saw him in the flesh. And then that brings us to Matthew chapter 28, 16 through 20. It's the last scene before Jesus ascends to heaven. Look at it. It says, then the 11, not 12, remember Judas has done now, gone on and done what he did. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, <coughs> they worshiped him. But some of them doubted. So Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's what we call a great commission. But that's not where we are today. 
He says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And then here's where we are. Because here's where Jesus comes in and here's where we see the Jehovah Shema. We see that in Ezekiel where God's talking about his presence. Well, now God's come and lived among us and now he's ascending to heaven and now he's looking at his disciples. He said, and be sure of this, boys. You ready for this? You ready? I am with you sometimes. Did I miss that? I'm with you always. How long? Even to the end of the age. So here's what that means for us today. You ready for this? We've not made it to the end of the age. I know. See, when you look at the gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter one, verse 23, it says, behold, Emmanuel. You remember that? Behold, Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? God with us. We're gonna celebrate that all next month. God with us. So Matthew starts with God with us and he ends with, by the way, I'm not going anywhere. Amen. Come on. Yeah. Think about the book in there. Do you know there's only three occurrences of Emmanuel in scripture in Isaiah two times and then now in Matthew? And it talks about the, the presence of God that that name Emmanuel talks about the nearness of God, that Christ's birth brought that in, in infinite holy God with re, within reach of the, of the finite that you and I could actually connect with God. <laughs> that God came alive to us so we can live with him. That he's our Emmanuel. He's our God with us at every stage of our spiritual life, at every moment that he's promised never to desert us or forsake us. And listen to this. I'm not going to wade into this very far, but when you look at the Greek of the Emmanuel, when it's mentioned, it is a five negatives emphasizing over and over again the impossibility of God being able to forsake us. I'm not gonna wade into that this morning because some of you already just went to sleep, amen? Because anytime you mention Greek, we, we miss it. But I want you to see that. The phrase, I will be with you, occurs nine times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we find where Jesus is over and over again saying, fear not. I, I read all those Facebook, Twitter, and those memes that, that, that fear not is 365 times in the scripture. That's debatable, okay? Don't believe everything you read on the internet. But we do find he says fear not a lot. And then the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13, look at this. He says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I'll never leave you and I'll never abandon you, quoting Deuteronomy. I'll never leave you or abandon you. And then he says, so this is why we can say with confidence. The reason we can be confident is because God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's why we'll say the Lord is my helper. So I'll have no fear. What can mere people do to me? What can you do to me really? That's what he's saying. Because God will never leave me or forsake me. You see, God is still active, even in uncertain times. That our hope and our faith, even when we can't see him, that we can rest of knowing that God will not abandon us. But here's what I know, and listen to me, church, and this is where I think some of us have gotten so laxed in this, is that, that, that we still have a responsibility in our relationship to seek God. Yes. As believers, to work out our, our salvation, not to work for our salvation because salvation comes by faith and faith alone, but we do have a responsibility in working out that salvation. In fact, responsibilities flowing from the belief that God is ever present, our Shema, our Emmanuel, look at them. There's five things I wanna show you. If God is with us, we must obey him. If Jesus, God with us, then we must trust him. If Jesus is God with us, we must strive to imitate him. Listen to me. If Jesus is God with us, we must continually worship and pray to him. And if he is God with us, we must love him. See, words like obey and trust and strive and worship and pray and love are all approached 
with so little reverence. There's so little reverence around those words today in the church. And I'm not just saying here, I'm just saying the church in general, especially in Western world America, in first world countries. See, we've all heard those stories in the Old Testament. We talked about Gideon last week where God whittled down his army (laughs) and went before them and destroyed all of them. We heard about Daniel's in the lion den. I've I've read that several times and I've even heard on the radio of guys preaching to Daniel in the lion's den and reading in my books that I'm reading right now about there were three and then there were four and oh, Nebuchadnezzar just gets really ticked off and heats it up seven times hotter. What does that even mean, seven times hotter, right? And so he throw them in and then there's three and now there's four and we read those stories and we've heard those stories and I know Some of you are sitting there going, why doesn't God do that? If God did that for me, then I would never doubt. I can remember 22 years ago now, I was arrested by the FBI. I'll never forget it. But before I was arrested, I was called into the DA's office. And I'll never forget when the DA stood in front of me and I had the FBI agent sitting over there beside me. He said these words to me. He said, Edward, welcome to the dance. In other words, here's what he was saying. I'm gonna prosecute you. Welcome to the dance because we're about to dance, son. And here's what he said to me. I'll never forget it. He said, let's see if your God will rescue you from this. And I'll never forget There was no fiery furnace. And by the way, there was no Shekinah glory of an angel of God that struck him dead. Now that would have been my idea, amen? Right? If you're watching, I love you, brother. I don't know where you are today. But anyway, I've never seen this cat again, amen? (laughs) Nothing. But here's what happened in that moment. I pushed away from the table at that DA's office. And I just simply said this, whether my God rescues me or not, It doesn't change who I am. No fiery furnace, no lapping water like a dog, no fire from heaven. Just a moment, just a moment. People ask me every day, Edward, you've You've been arrested, you've been divorced, you've been fired three times, you've been run out of town, you've got newspaper clippings of you. By the way, if you're visiting the summit, welcome, I'm the pastor, amen? (laughs) You think you're jacked up, amen? I don't tell this story very often, but here's where people ask me all the time, why didn't you give up? Because there was something in me that I didn't want to shipwreck my faith. There was something in me that I knew God was bigger than anything. And by the way, look at my life 22 years later as God has begun to restore the years the locusts have destroyed. Amen? He's restoring those years. And if I'd have quit 22 years ago and gave up on God because my first wife did this or, or the FBI did that or, or I did this or I messed this up, I'm gonna tell you something, I would miss what God is doing today, his presence of the, who he is today, amen? Yeah. And see, some of you gave up, man. Yeah. You bought the lie of the culture. that God doesn't love you and God screwed up in making you. And you walked away and you abandoned and shipwrecked your faith. So listen to that song this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. That I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. That I raise a hallelujah that no weapon, that my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah because heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn in the middle of the storm. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder. You're going to hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. I know about that because I've been in the middle of the ashes. I've been in the middle. Death is defeated. The king is alive. Hmm. How different. Listen to me, how different the path of Christianity today 
and what we call maturity and how cavalier we are as we approach God. You see those words, obey and trust and strive and worship and pray and love and death. Listen to me, church. Jesus said that anyone who comes after me must die. I want to do what I want to do, Edward. No, Jesus said you must die. You must crucify the flesh. No, we don't like that. We would much rather have a preacher tell us, you can do what you want to. God loves you. God does love you. But listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, you must die. There's so little trembling, so little vigilance. There's this kind of casual, slack, careless attitude. First world Christianity that we might shipwreck our faith. Some of us don't even think about it. Some of us don't even think about it until someone like me stands on the stage or maybe you stop on TV long enough to hear a preacher say, and you go, ah, but then we move on because it's all good, right? And so we've just kind of mechanicalized this automation that we take for granted that we live in America. We're prospering. We have money, a house, cars, resources. You were able to turn your heat on last night And we never think about that the decisions we make could shipwreck our faith. We prayed to receive Jesus, so we're safe. We never think about working at our salvation. And yet, Paul says this in Philippians 2.12, I want to show you again. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Look what he says. Continue to work out. Everybody say work out. Anybody like working out? A few of us, right? Okay, most of us don't, do we? He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Second Chronicles 15 says, the Lord, if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And we don't like that, do we? We don't like that. Because you see, in the new covenant, it's true that God will never forsake his children Jesus came as Emmanuel. He bookended the book of Matthew. I came unto you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. But the proof that we are children, listen to me, the proof that we are children is that he works in us a vigilance not to forsake him. That when those moments of ashes come and those moments where we don't get it and those moments where we don't understand it and those moments where we are being bullied and we're being told and we're being pushed and we're being all all this stuff that we, we justify, And in that moment, there's something working in us that's vigilantly saying, I will not shipwreck. Again, the principle from last week, look at it. Disobedience disrupts peace, but obedience brings peace. And with peace comes righteousness. You see, God's not forsaking us in the work he does in us to keep us from forsaking us. No, Philippians 2.13 says, for it is God who works in you. By the way, he's working, work out your salvation because he's working in us to will and to act and in order to fulfill his good purposes. So here's the question. What could rob us of God's presence? I mean, he's ever present. He says, God came, God dwelled among us. And then at the end, he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And, And in the form of the Holy Spirit, he filled us. What could cause us to miss him? What could cause us to shipwreck our faith? So we don't like those words, do we? So just in case you're wondering, let me mention four things, right? You ready for this? Because you want to shipwreck your faith? And by the way, I know a little bit about failure. I've been fired three times, divorced, been arrested, run out of town, served five years probation, 250 hours community service, $33,000 in fines. Anybody want to sign up for that? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the scars. So I know a little bit about this. You want to shipwreck your faith? Then number one, direct disobedience. Go on. When you willingly and knowingly disobey God, you are on your way to shipwreck your faith. Look what Ephesians 4, 23 through 30 says. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on the new nature. Put on the new nature, right? Created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. How do you do that? Stop lying. Look what he says. I love Paul. Stop lying. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. Tell your mom and daddy the truth, kids. Quit lying. 
Well, it's just a little white line. Ain't gonna no, let me tell you something. Here's what will happen. You will shipwreck your faith one day. You will shipwreck your faith because when you start telling little lies now, then they become bigger and bigger and bigger down the road. And you think if I'm lying, go ask any of the adults that's sitting in this room today. It starts with those little things. Stop lying. And by the way, don't sin by letting your anger get out of control. Hello. Don't let the sun go down on why you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If that's not enough, look at verse 28. If you're a thief, quit it. Isn't that good? If you're a thief, stop it. And that doesn't just mean the guy that robbed the bank a few weeks ago quit stealing from the IRS. That's not fair, preacher. I don't think Paul qualified it, did he? He said, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Amen? Now listen, write me an email, y'all, you want to be mad at me. But listen, the truth is as simple as that, isn't it? Quit stealing. It's amazing to me when what's told to me at the school for teenagers that steal food. I'm blown away. Scripture says you're going to shipwreck your faith. Quit stealing. And if that's not enough, look at verse 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Verse 30, do not bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guarantee that you'll be saved on the day of redemption. So therefore, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander. And in case I missed anything, as well as all types of evil behavior, Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You want to shipwreck your faith, just ignore that. Just start right there. Instead, Paul says, stop lying. Stop letting anger get in touch, get, get a hold of you. Quit stealing. Quit cussing and using abusive language. Don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. In other words, start living right. Start living right. So, uh, I know some of you are going, what's that mean? You know what that means. You know what that means. You know what it means to walk in front of somebody when you should have let them go first, right? Your daddy taught you better than that. Amen? Amen? You know what it means to step over a piece of trash instead of picking it up and taking care of the earth that God gave us. Come on. It does, we're not doing brain surgery here, amen? amen? Some of us make this so complicated. See, when you grieve the Holy Spirit, you quench the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was given to us, just like the, the Spirit of God was given to the Israelites when they were going through the desert. He was a pillar of fire at, by night and a cloud by day that, that to guide them, that God has put his Holy Spirit in us. You want to grieve that, be disobedient. Here's the second thing, have divided devotion. Divided devotion, it's an idol. An idol is anything we love more, fear more, serve more, or trust more than God. In the Old Testament, they struggled with the idols because that was their culture. They would build gold and carve wood and all that. And I know we're way more sophisticated than that, so let me throw up some questions about this. Is there anyone or anything that takes precedence over God in our lives? How about social media? How about your job? How about your kids? How about youth sports? Is there anyone or anything that is, of great, that is a greater controlling factor in our behavior than God? Is there a relationship that means more to us than God? Maybe it's your addiction. Hello. Is there a treasure that means more to us? Don't you touch my car. Been guilty. Just confessing. Thanks, babe. Appreciate you laughing with me. Everybody else is like, I ain't saying a word. I ain't saying nothing. Is there anything that gets more of our attention than God? Listen, when you divide your devotion, here's a third thing, displace dependence. When God gives us a victory and we know that's God moving and we give somebody else credit, we give something else and we depend on that person or we depend on that thing. Remember when Peter was walking on the water 
He stepped out of the boat, and as long as his eyes were fixed on Jesus, not that you're Jesus, okay, but as long as his eyes were fixed on Jesus, he was safe. But the moment he took his eyes down, at that moment, his dependence became on him and his legs and his courage and his moment. And what did he do? He sank. Here's the fourth thing. Determined defiance. In Exodus chapter 32, Aaron had led the Israelites to build a golden calf. And they were so stinking excited that he led them to worship the calf instead of God. The God who delivered them. The God who would give a pillar of fire at night, a cloud by day, had led them across, had fed them, had built a cow. And they bowed down to a cow. Really? And God got so mad. You know how mad God was? He was fixing to scorch them all and start over with Moses. Amen? It's like mom and dad looking at their child and going, I'll send you back where you came from because I can make another one. Amen? I know none of you have ever said that, right? If you have, you're a sinner. Lord, forgive me. Amen. Right? In fact, God called them a stiff neck. The, the exact opposite is a meek and, and pliable. We see in hindsight. And we go, I'd never do that. I would, I would never build a golden calf. I mean, I would never have a calf in my house, man. I, no, I would never do that because we're way more sophisticated. So let me ask you some questions. Look at these. Number one, is there someone God has laid on our hearts to go to them and ask for forgiveness? But you haven't gone to that person because you think they owe you something or you think they need to pay. Listen to me, you can shipwreck your faith. And I, I told you this, this is 99.3%, that's a made up statistic. That's 30 years of ministry. You wanna shipwreck your faith? Then hold on to bitterness, thinking somebody should pay and don't go to them and forgive them. You'll shipwreck your faith, man. You'll shipwreck, and listen, you can sit in church every Sunday and everybody's gonna think, oh, I'm just so glad you but inside you are seething. Is there someone God's laid on your heart to go to them and ask for forgiveness, but you haven't gone? Has God given us an impulse to serve in a specific capacity, but we refuse? How about this one? Has God laid something on your heart that he wants you to give? Has God been telling us that there's a wrong relationship in our life that we need to break off? By the way, some of you teenagers will shipwreck your life by holding on to that person who you think is your forever and you're 15, you're 17. And I know some of you guys are high school sweethearts. Okay, I get it. I'm not saying, listen, be careful. Has God called us into missions or full-time Christian service and you just keep saying no? Listen, disobedience disrupts peace. Disobedience or obedience brings peace and peace accompanies righteousness. And to settle for anything less than God's presence in our lives will destroy and shipwreck us. You see, he's already promised, I'll never leave you or forsake you, even to the end of the age. By the way, he's still at work in your life. He's still in work at your life. I think about where you were just a couple of years ago, and he's still at work in your life. That after so many years, you're back on this stage singing that you thought something was gone that God has taken out of the ashes and brought you up and given your voice again. And by the way, you had some sort of lung issue, did you not? Yeah, lost part of it. Yeah, just lost part of your lungs, and yet God's resurrected that from the ashes. Amen? Yeah. Come on. Woo. Don't shipwreck your faith, church. He's with you. The culture's gonna tell you he doesn't love you. He's screwed up by making you that you're flawed and all the other things. Listen, I'm flawed and screwed up. Come on. Thank you, baby. <laughs> My elders know that. You know that. I'm looking at Russ over there. He knows that. I hear Jake coughing back there somewhere in the dark. They know I'm jacked up. Amen? No. We still love you. Thank you. And I love you. But listen to me. It's not what I think. It's about his presence in my journey that I don't want to do anything that would shipwreck my faith. Amen. And I've been close. I've thought about it. I've had opportunity. I don't want to shipwreck my faith. Somebody asked me the other day, why do you keep going? Because what choice do I have? 
He's been good to me. And I don't want to do anything that's going to destroy that. I love Psalms 139, 7 through 12, and I'll close with this. The psalmist David says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even if your hand, even there your hand guides me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become not around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. So how do we experience his presence? How do we move in that? Realize this, that he hasn't gone anywhere. And by the way, he even loves you as you are in all your jacked up mess. Amen. He loves you. But listen to me. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is what? Be careful. Be careful and make sure that your culture of your mind, remember repentance means metanoia, means to change your mind and think like God, not the culture, not what somebody on the internet says, not what some big name guy with a bunch of letters behind his name. By the way, some of those people are the dumbest people I know. Can I just say that? I'm not against education, but sometimes I wonder with the more letters you have behind your name of where your brains go. Amen? I know, I'm not against it. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Don't shipwreck your faith just because a group of people said you're screwed up, you're messed up. Listen, you are screwed up. That's why you need Jesus. That's why you need a savior. And the only way you get that is through repentance and confession. Confession is agreeing with God, you're jacked up. Repentance is changing your mind to think like God and letting Jesus become Lord of your life. Have you done that? If not, I invite you to. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can get fired up. We can pray. We can sing. We can do all those things that you've called us to do. But Lord, I pray for that one that sits in this room today. That very honestly, God, they're defiant. They're disobedient. They're divided. Some have all of them. They checked all the box. God, would you woo them? Because the reality is, God, you're here and you still love them. And all the judgment and all the wrath is poured out on Jesus. That through him today, they can be forgiven. They can come home. They can enter in. So God, give us courage today as we take communion, as we respond, as we pray. As these are elders and prayer teams across the front, Lord, to pray over people, would you let us respond in a way that honors you? So, Lord, I love you. Thank you that you're here, even though some of us hadn't felt a thing in this room because we're so far away or we're so dark right now. God, would you help our unbelief to know that you're here and you love us. So, God, we love you. We worship you. And we ask it in that beautiful, precious name, Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.